Now we're going to prepare our hearts for the Lord's table. As we remember Christ's coming, his death and his resurrection. And as we remember Christ, it's important that we remember true things about him. And how wonderful that we just got to sing songs that remind us of who Jesus Christ really is. Not as we might pretend he might be or would like to think him to be, but as he actually is. And to know who Christ actually is, we need to put our eyes on God's word, since he's the only one who does not lie. Uh, If you are here and do not have a Bible with you, we would love to put one in your hands. Uh, Some men are going to grab some Bibles up here and walk down the aisles. If you don't have a Bible this morning, just put up your hand and they will get one to you. If you don't own a Bible, this one is yours to keep. So this morning we're going to remember one aspect of Christ's death, one of the purposes of his death, namely that this sacrifice was designed and intended that you might not sin. Or to put it positively, that you would grow in holiness, that you would do what is right. God's complete and irrevocable forgiveness for all of our sins is not a freedom to sin, but a freedom from sin to holiness. So turn with me, a lot of places we could turn, but turn with me this morning to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. If finding books of the Bible is relatively new to you, this is towards the the end of the Bible. You've got Revelation right there at the end and then a few short letters before it. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, then Revelation. So we're going to be looking at 1st John chapter 2, starting at the beginning of the chapter. The Apostle John, carried along by God himself, writes these true words. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. So you see the purpose of John in writing these verses, don't you? I write these things to you so that you may not sin. He has just finished writing such wonderful good news in chapter 1. That we can have fellowship with God the Father and his Son Jesus Christ. God is light. We are not. Our sin is darkness. And yet we can come to the light Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And John writes, I write these things to you. Why? I have a purpose so that you may not sin. John wants his readers to know Christ, to have fellowship with him, to obey him, to not sin, to keep his commandments. Do you? Have you come to know Jesus in this way? Has your knowledge of Jesus become fellowship with Jesus and thereby produce obedience to Jesus? Now, there is a danger lurking here, uh, especially in speaking about not sinning and obeying Christ during a short communion message. We might be tempted, even now in this time, to look inward, to look at ourselves And find the strength to somehow do this on our own, which would lead us to becoming despondent if our sins are so many and so overwhelming. Or it might lead us to become proud if we think that in some way we have scrubbed the outside of this container and made it look pleasing to man. But thankfully, God's word will not let us go there. Sandwiched between the appeal not to sin in verse 1 and then that... uh, Test for whether or not we know Christ in verse 3, there are two massive hopes back to back. Neither of them accomplished by us, both of them accomplished for us by a very capable friend. So even as we examine ourselves this morning, which we must do, we need to do so looking to Christ so that we may be sure that if we find any hope, we find it there. So two hopes. The first hope is right there in verse 1. I write these things to you, John writes. I write these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, 
the righteous. So that is our first hope. We have an advocate. John did not end that sentence with, so that you may not sin, period. He keeps the thought going with that conjunction, and. He's showing that there's no discord, there's no disagreement with what he just said and what he's about to say. And what he says next is, if anyone does sin, if anyone does. And this is a grammatical construction that tells the reader that this if statement is not hypothetical. It's very likely going to happen. People are going to sin. Anyone, if anyone sins. Who does John have in mind? Who is this anyone? In the next clause, John uses the pronoun we. If anyone sins, we have an advocate. Who's going to sin? We are. All of us sin. And when we do sin, we have an advocate. That is, we have someone to speak up for us. Someone to defend us. Someone to befriend us and stand by our side in court. And that friend, that defender that we have in this court, this highest of courts, is none other than Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. You don't want me on your side before the throne of God, where there's only pure light and holiness and glory. I don't belong there. I'm as guilty as you are. You don't want your favorite pastor or theologian or even the Apostle John there to defend you. You don't want your good works there to defend you. We are all guilty. We are going to need God there to help us. We're going to need a Savior, a Redeemer. We're going to need one who is guiltless, who is perfect. And Jesus Christ is all three. That's the first hope. We have Jesus Christ as our advocate before the throne of God. And the second hope supports the first. We might ask, how can Christ stand up for those who break the law, for those who are guilty? How can Christ befriend those who are guilty? How is that just? What evidence or testimony does Christ have to excuse you in that court? Verse 2 is the answer to those questions. John writes, he is the propitiation for our sins. That's the second hope. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. That is, he's the one who stood condemned in our place and swallowed the anger that God rightly has in response to our rebellion. All of it. John uses the plural, sins. The just punishment for our sins was given to Christ instead of us. So that means Jesus in the courtroom before his father is there to tell his father about his perfect sacrifice, not our perfect service. One commentator put it this way, Jesus' role as our defender is not that of proving our innocence. Rather, he intercedes on our behalf before the righteous judge of the universe and turns back his wrath by satisfying his righteous demand for punishment. He is both our defender and our sacrifice. And my friends, Jesus is successful in both of those roles as defender and sacrifice, advocate and propitiation. And all of this was, after all, the Father's plan from the beginning. First John 4 verse 9 says, The love of God was shown to us in this way. God, the Father, sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. Just, just think how ready God the Father is to accept the testimony of his Son in that court. This whole rescue was designed by God, carried out by God, and it is successful. It works. And it works for everyone who comes. Christ's sacrifice was not only successful, but sufficient. Back in 1 John 2.2, 2, John writes, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. So anyone from anywhere with any background who comes to Christ certainly finds life and the means to walk in the light as he is in the light. So if you are a believer, these are truths that you can hold to, hopes that you can hope in. And they're designed to help you grow in doing what is right. 
If you do not yet understand your guilt before God and are not trusting in Jesus to be your defender and sacrifice, then do two things as we come to the Lord's table. First, let the bread and juice pass you by. Uh, This time is for believers to remember their Savior. Indeed, I mean, how can you remember someone that you have not yet known? And secondly, this morning, just hear that this message is not intended to tell you that you must clean up your act first. This whole message is intended to point you to the one who can actually rescue you. So please come. Uh, Find me or find another believer that you know and ask them about the Lord Jesus. If you don't know anyone, you can uh, come over here to the door on this side and someone will be there to, to talk with you, pray with you after the service. If you know in fellowship with Christ, then believer, remember that in Christ you are free. You are free. You are free not to sin. Remember that your growth in holiness and obedience is going to help you to know that you know your Savior. And if you've sinned, if you're sitting there remembering more of your wrongs than your rights this past week, then take heart, dear saint. We have a friend at the throne of a loving father. We have one who stood in our place and took what we deserved for all our sins. So please join your fellow brothers and sisters as we remember Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. You can take communion as you're ready, and then Smed will come up in a few minutes to pray with us. So men, please come and serve us.